Good morning, Panthers. I'm Leah Rojo. And I'm Connor Anthony. Today we will look at Teens with Tattoos, a student living up to family expectations, a problem in our area, and much more. It all starts now. seen a lot of improvements this year. John and Juliana bring us a scoop on what the Melville Market has been designing. Uh, we sell anything from chips, uh, some cookies, to drinks, uh, slushies, all types of stuff. Got to take advanced marketing. So if you take advanced marketing, you just talk to Spitz and she'll get you set up on the school store. Uh, the website name is wwwsquareup or dash melvilmarket storecom uh, and it's pretty much just any of our products that are online. Uh, you can get in the store too, so you can get anything delivered to your tap from the website. Uh, tap delivery was pretty much just an idea I thought of one day in Spitz's class. I was like, why don't we just deliver the food from the store to people's taps? And that's pretty much how it started. The Melville Market now has an app that you can buy from the App Store. It is powered by another app called Flock. And on it, you can get rewards, see pictures, and get basic information about the store. On the app, you can do all sorts of crazy stuff. Like, I can do uh, punch-out cards uh, virtually. I can do check-ins. Uh, I can send out rewards. I can send out gift cards. Uh, so I can do all sorts of stuff. After in-tap delivery, uh, there may be some new promotions coming out. You'll just have to wait and find out. Next, Hannah and Kate take us to Creefcore Lake to show us which students took the plunge. Bullet Plunge is an annual event at, um, it's usually in Creep Corps, that's where we go to, and it's an event where we raise money, after $75, and then we go plunge in a freezing cold lake, it's a really fun event, and all the money we raise goes to SOMO, Special Olympics in Missouri. Special Olympics is just something that gives kids who are different or may not be seen as normal, and it gives them a chance to go out and be normal, and it lets them play physical, act physical activities that we take for granted that they may not be able to do and polar plunges is a really good way for Special Olympics Missouri to get money to send them to state and world and all that cool stuff. I do it because Special Olympics is my favorite charity and it means so much more to me than anything. Uh, it just really hits home for me and I love it. How you doing, Melville? Oh, things going on right now? Okay. Student council is the one who like puts it on at our school, but if you're not in school, you can still join. So you can find Ms. Preka or Ms. Kern, they can talk to you about it. So um, you'll have to sign up under Suco's like team thing, you don't have to be in Suco to be inside of it. Also, in order to do it, you have to raise $75, you can um, get it donated, you don't have to like make your own money and raise it yourself, but $75 to go to where you get to have a shirt, a dinner that day, or lunch, we know time it is, dinner that day, and um, you get to plunge that day, and you also get like hot chocolate or like water or whatever. So it's a really good event. The fun, most fun part about it is like you can send pe meet people who aren't in your same school because although you plunge together with your school district, you still meet people from like all over the area who are plunging with the same intent as you are. So it's really nice to make connections that way. Illegal drugs are a significant issue in the St. Louis area. Amanda and Ivy sat down with an expert to get the facts on heroin. 911, what's your emergency? I just found someone passed out on the floor and I don't know what to do. Is the person unconscious? Yes, I don't think they're alive. Still full of pulse? I felt, but I don't feel anything. What do I do? I'm freaking out. I'll send an ambulance to your location. Okay, please hurry. In the last 10 years, thousands of people have died due to heroin overdose just in the St. Louis region. 
We spoke to the Public Awareness Specialist at the National Council of Alcohol and Drug Abuse here in St. Louis on what heroin is and what you can do to prevent it. Heroin is a dr drug derived from the opium poppy, uh, much like cocaine is derived from the coca leaf. Anytime you're using intravenous uh, methods, you're increasing your risk for bloodborne pathogens, so HIV, hepatitis C, things like that. Typically, when somebody uses a pill, they're not ingesting it, they're not swallowing it. They open it up and they snort it, much more akin to cocaine. Uh, that didn't used to be possible, but we're seeing more and more pure heroin, and with that purity, uh, it's able to be used nasally. Study shows that the rate of heroin users have gone up because heroin is the cheapest drug out there. Ranging from $5 to $10 a pill, it is the second most common drug here in Missouri after marijuana. The St. Louis region is being hardest hit by the heroin epidemic, but it's the entire region that's getting hit. If you want to look at last year, um, St. Louis County had about 135 heroin prescription opiate and fentanyl overdoses for the entire county. Um, that's one of the highest in the region. Uh, but, it, you know, St. Louis County is very diverse. You've got North County, West County, South County, but we're seeing a lot of deaths in all of those areas. So if it's Kirkwood, if it's Ferguson, if it's Melville, if it's Chesterfield, we're seeing heroin and opiate overdoses in all of those regions. To cut down heroin usage in the St. Louis community, police officers were given a special nasal spray to put in their cop cars in case of an emergency. Uh, St. Louis County Police, um we have in some of our cars we have a nasal spray which is narcan and narcan is administered uh, as a nasal spray to somebody that's suffering um, from a heroin overdose and what it does is when that drug is administered it uh, blocks effects of the opiates um, which um, heroin is an opiate drug so it blocks those effects and allows the person to start breathing again on their own um, and therefore we can get um, further first aid, um, follow up through the ER with that. Um, so it's a great first aid, uh, first responder tool um, because without that you have, uh, the time is um, important for a person, especially when they're not breathing, um, the side effects and brain damage and not being able to get somebody back from that. To anyone fighting heroin addiction, the best thing you can do is get help. Um, we have free assessments and referrals to treatment here at NCADA. People can go to theplacetoturn.com and click on the get help option and that will connect them to our counselors who can do an assessment and refer them to the most appropriate uh, treatment facility for their needs. And it's absolutely free for anyone 19 and under. Finding one's identity is an important part of one's teenage years. Brielle and Dan bring us one student's story. Well, kids that are transgender have a lot of the same challenges that any child in the general population has. So the challenge is, is that they have those on top of gender identity issues. So it's, it's a tough road to walk a lot of the time. Um, the, the population of transgender teens is the highest population of people at risk for suicide. So it's, it's a serious, serious challenge. I decided to come out because I never felt comfortable being called by the wrong name or the wrong pronouns, and I didn't feel like myself. I didn't know who this person was that I was being called, and it bothered me so much. It made me uncomfortable. Another thing that we don't really think about all that often is how we address people. So if someone is a trans, is a trans identifies as a transgender student, it's really respectful to ask them how would you, what pronouns do you want to use and what name do you want us to use. Coming out can be very difficult because you have to come out to everyone. Not, you don't come out only once. You have to talk to everybody and you have to say, hey, I'm trans. And it's hard because you don't know how somebody will take it. For, um, for schools to do a good job reaching out to transgender students, I think first and foremost, if you can somehow address people as individuals and ask them what they need because everybody's needs are different. On top of that, I think to, 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 to demonstrate that you're a welcoming school is really important. So there's training that the staff and the faculty and even students can get. Um, 
about how to help people that are transgendered. Certainly transgendered bathroom facilities and gym facilities make a big difference. Having a really active GSA can be helpful. My situation has been that I have to pay for a locker and go to the nurse's office and I kind of feel like an outcast because of it and there should be more gender neutral things in general and in schools that would be really nice not only for trans people but for other people as well. Um, it's a challenge when a person doesn't feel like they belong in the body that they inhabit and they're sort of at war with it. That can be really difficult and things that we take for granted as people that are not transgender. We don't think about which bathroom we walk into or which box we check on a form or if we can go to the beach in a swimming suit and that's those are not easy issues for a person that's transgender to navigate. Knowing that somebody is there for you even if it's a teacher or a janitor even, it it's okay and it makes people, the students feel more safe, it makes the Melville community better and a safer place for everyone. You know, I feel like what's most important to me when thinking about students that are transgender is to never forget that they're somebody's brother or sister, daughter or son, that they're human beings and they are deserving of respect and love and kindness as much as anybody else. Next we have a story on one Melville family who shows acceptance every day. Many of you may be familiar with the Hemingways, wholesome family, caretakers to many successful students here at Melville, but do you know the great lengths the Hemingways have gone to take in children of different backgrounds, ethnicities, as well as disabilities? Luckily the Hemingways allowed us access to their home to get a closer look. We have a son who uh, exhibited some behaviors that have, uh, you know, that caused a diagnosis and, and as we were going through the process with him, we were told by some of the case managers that we were dealing with at the time that we had a um, proclivity to deal with certain things that didn't throw us off guard uh, or throw us for a loop or just challenge us in a way where we just wouldn't, we wouldn't overreact to certain situations, I guess is the best way to put it. And so from that situation, it just kind of arose that, okay, if we can do this and if we can help some kids out and some families out at the same time, then why not do it? One of Kevin and I's passions uh, is for helping families. Uh, we haven't ever adopted any of these children, but they've come into our home and we've been able to help their families, their grandmas, a lot of grandmas, single moms, um, and moms and dads. And um, we know exactly what, what it feels like to be in their shoes. So we really like doing that. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that we help the kids. The most prominent one we do is we just give them attention and we make sure that uh, their voices are heard and they're having communication with people. We make sure that they're living a life that they want to live even though they're not necessarily in the best of situations. And we also make sure that uh, they're not being, they're not, they're not going through like a sensory overload and they're not um, having to react to different situations on their own. We kind of just be a companion and we make sure that they're going through their walk of life with somebody uh, that's alongside of them. Okay, so what's your name? Drew. Drew? Mm hmm Do you enjoy living here? Yes. Uh, what experiences have you had with this family since living with them? Love. Have you ever go on any, like, vacations or trips or, um, you know, outings with the Hemingways? Mm-hmm. Yes. Where have you been? Cece's Pizza? Yeah, Cece's Pizza. True, you can say more than one word. Cece's Pizza and going shopping. Did you like it? Yes. We go to the pool too, don't we? Oh, uh, yeah, but you don't go. <laughs> <laughs> you don't go. I would say that the biggest effect it's had on my life is that I've learned to care for other people in a way that benefits me as well as benefits other people. I've learned that taking care of people is a really enriching experience and it's something that everybody can do no matter how good you think you are at it or how bad you think you are at it. It's just something that um, can come natural to everybody and I've really had a, it's had a positive effect on me because I think that I've become a more giving person and a more, in general, just a more positive person about different outlooks because I've seen kids come through here that you would have never guessed it would have been uh, quote unquote fixable or quote unquote um, manageable or you know someone that you could help and they end up striving and succeeding in their own uh, in their own way 
uh, and it's really, really cool to watch, and it's cool to know that you did something about it and you helped them uh, get to that point. Brad and Lexi have the story with students with tattoos. And the significance behind the ink. I think 40% of our clientele are teenagers. Let's see, um, 16 to like, I think 24, you know what I'm saying? But that falls in that range. So it's a lot. Um, my tattoo is a cross with an American flag draped around it. Um, it's in honor of my grandfather and just his whole like faith and freedom. It's like the two most important things to him. He passed away a few years ago, so I thought I would get it. I got it on my 18th birthday. Um, my next one's also going to be in honor of him. Not sure what it's going to be yet. This was $200. Um, I got it because it's going to be something that's on my body for the rest of my life and it's always going to be there. Like I could spend $200 on anything, but this I will always have and always remember like until I die. So basically you come into the studio, you look at portfolios, you want to make sure that you like the person that you're getting ready to do a consultation with work. So once you do that, you pick the person, you kind of give us some type of reference or an idea or something, and then we'll go over that with you. Once we come up with a final design, we'll give you a price and then we will um, bring you back and, and do the tattoo. Yeah, I got a tattoo of a sewing needle for my grandma. She was um, a seamstress whenever she was alive and I always wanted to get a tattoo and so I decided that my first one would be for her. So we're gonna take that image that you like and make it fit the area. And then if you like the sketch, then we finalize the sketch and make it so we can tattoo it, which means we have to make it into a stencil. So we make the stencil, put the stencil on you, and then we, we're, we're actually implanting pigment into your subcutaneous, you know, with a tattoo machine. All right, so uh, my first one, I got this. Uh, it's Hebrew for Krav Maga, which is a fighting style I started in freshman year. Um, I got this before I turned 18, actually, on July 30th, uh, exactly a month before my birthday. Um, I had to have my parents sign for that one. And uh, my second one is this anchor here. It's kind of sideways right now, but um, uh, I got that on senior skip day. Um, that was an interesting first one as um, I go by myself and actually get it. The anchor um, actually represents strength and stability. Um, it might sound cheesy, but you know, no matter how rough life gets, you know, you always have the strength or you know stability to stand your own ground. So these needles are super, super thin, and we group them all together, and then that makes um, a liner or a shader. Okay, so you've got like your pencil, and then you've got like your paintbrush, right? So you got your liner and your shader. So what that does is you've got a machine that actually makes it a repetitive punching. So once it does that, then we put your stencil on and you will take that needle and we'll just kind of trace that stencil. Um, my tattoo is Roman numerals 10-2 and then 210, And it's the date that my grandma and my uncle passed away. And it's on my right rib cage. I decided to get it because obviously it had meaning and my mom's rules were that my tattoo had to have something to do with my uncle. So, and yeah, and I don't really know where I got the idea. I think I just thought about the dates because they're opposite, so I thought it would look nice. An actual setup to do a tattoo is about 50 bucks. That's not even paying your artist. Okay, so you gotta think every shop's gonna have a minimum or they're gonna lose money. So average minimum, it's like 70, 80 bucks. Uh, minimum per hourly is when you would get like a big piece and you would do it in session. So we just charge you hourly. That's between 120 to 150, kind of depends on your skill level of the artist that you pick. Um, average tattoo is about two hours. Uh, my tattoo is a Polynesian tribal shoulder sleeve at the moment. It's mainly just because to show that I wanted it, nothing other than that. Uh, it's just something that I've always wanted. I've always found tattoos to be interesting and my sister has a bunch and that's what it really started. But uh, my experience was definitely first time feeling that needle. The first prick was the worst, and after that, it was like nothing. So per person, it definitely depends. Because um, I have chicks that fall asleep, and then I have chicks that can't sit. You know, can't sit still. So really, that that depends. But I'm gonna say, the bigger your piece, the more it's gonna hurt. My only advice is, if you get a tattoo, really look into the design that you want because that's gonna be on your body forever. Finally, we have the story on Sim Gormley and his journey to state. Every year, wrestlers across Missouri train in hopes of competing in the state tournament. On February 13th, Tim Gormley placed fourth at the district tournament, qualifying him for a chance to compete at state. I feel pretty great, you know, I 
I've been uh, I've been waiting for this moment for the majority of my life, and I'm just I'm pretty happy. Well, it's a little bit different than just coaching somebody and having them make it to state. It, while you're happy that they make it, it's it's just a little bit extra when it's one of your own children that make it. It gives you a little bit of extra feeling of pride beyond just uh, being happy that you've taken another kid to state. Uh, I think. Tim's very proud of the fact that he did qualify for state this year, especially since his brother qualified last year. He wanted to at least make that this year, and uh, I think he accomplished that part of the goal. As a team, our goal should be to qualify more uh, as individuals for the uh, state tournament, um, also to have winning records in our dual meets, um, and for those individuals to have winning records as they come up. Uh, usually, with the winning records comes the medals and comes all that other stuff. So just focusing more on their individual matches um, is something that they should all be striving to do. Well, that wraps up this edition of Memel Today. Thanks for watching.